All right, 52 SC special guest, we have John from Clam Mania, all right? I have been wanting to get clams from you forever. I've seen you on Instagram all of the time. I ran them here at the show and I said, you know what? I want to learn about clams. I don't know hardly anything about it. It has kept me from wanting to do it. It's perfect for learning about it. We have a live audience here at Reef of Palooza, Dallas. And now I got 17 questions about keeping uh, clams here. <laughs> I'm gonna find out all of it right along with you because I don't know anything about this and I'm gonna try after we learn this. All right, you ready? Yeah, of course, right, let's do it. John. Thank you. Okay, uh, all right, we're starting with where are most of these clams normally found? What does it look like under the ocean? What is it? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the clams are found in not too, too deep waters. And it's kind of weird because it's hard to answer the question. We'll make it fast as possible because each species is found in different areas, right? And what makes it very special about this is that just like corals, each coral is found in different areas because they're found in different areas, you have to kind of uh, adjust the lighting towards that. Mm. Uh, and uh, so it's uh, for maximas, for the most part, they're found in, let's say, three, usually five meters. Uh, three to five meters or a little deeper than that. Uh, so therefore, they don't need that much light compared to like Croceas. Croceas, I, I can see them all the time, like, you know, on the, the shoreline when the tide goes down, you'll see a couple of Croceas hanging out. And then- Just uh, feet. Just, yeah, it's just beautiful. And then it's, it's funny, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story with that, is that I was recently in uh, uh, Egypt, in the Red Sea. And being in the Red Sea, you see lots of Red Sea clams and there are maximas and things like that. Uh, and right next to the resort, uh, at the very end of the resort, you're literally like the water's right next to you and you see clams. Hmm. And it's, it's amazing, but the corals are dead. The clams can take the light, but those aquaporas can't. So you go a little deeper, all of a sudden you see aquapora, and then you see a lot more clams. So it just tells you, yes, the eggs landed right there initially, but what happens is that the ones that survived, who tolerated the light, right, survived. But most of them are a little deeper uh, for the maximus, which is that three meter to five meter mark. Uh -huh. yeah. And then the Dorasas are different locations and same thing with Squamosas, things like that. So we look at that like in the beginning, like I'm finding that is the case. It's like I don't always have to emulate nature. Yeah. But if I start there and yeah. understand this, yeah. then I also understand all clams are not the same. Yes. You know, right? Exactly. And so in, in this case, uh, I, I would also say, you know, you can hear the differences in some of this stuff, but you know, when you have somebody like specializes in this, you know, like you do, when you contact them and say, hey, you know, I have a tank that looks like this or I'm building a tank that looks like this, yeah. what types of clams would do good in my system? Yeah. You know, and now you're buying your pets from somebody to help you curate your tank like that. Yes. All right. Uh, I've heard this early on that getting small clams are bad, they won't live. Is that true? <laughs> okay, I get that a lot. Uh, I think almost everybody approaches me. I, whether you're an expert, you're a fish store owner, or you're the new hobbyist, and it's online all the time. It's what you read. It's been in, you know, on, on auto articles, every single article. People repeat it all the time. And I have to tell you, no, it's not true. So uh, my understanding is that's based on the fact that they're not able to capture enough light to produce their own, you know, they need natural foods or something yeah, to yeah. survive. I gotta tell you, like, it's been a long time since I had a clam, but I had won a bunch of them at a show mm. many, many millennia ago mm. uh, from ORA. Ah. And, and they were all small and, and yeah. you know, like not all of them did great, but a lot of them did. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like, so you're thinking your head hit and miss, and it's like for us, like we'll, we'll say, well, I read the article said that, you know, these clams usually are what I've been hearing from clients and people all the time from everybody. It's two inch and smaller, you have to feed them. So in their head, my God, this is less than two inch. I have to feed this clam, right? And that's what you're thinking. And then in your process of elimination of it died, therefore, that's the reason. So I kind of was kind of with the barriers is like, I didn't want to feed them. I was like, I don't want another thing I need to do, you know? Uh, and so like, I don't really want to do that. So what you're saying is nonsense? Yes. Uh, well, the, the fact that uh, for us, it's important that for me, I had to really do a lot of work and I've been doing this um, for a long time, uh, researching, uh, not just researching, but also growing the clams, breeding the clams uh, and keeping them in house for a very long time. And when you do that, you really get to learn from A to Z the whole life, you know, and then in the life, you get to see the adjustment if you need to adjust things, if it's not doing well, lighting, uh, you know, chemistry or something like that. And then as the characteristics come by and you realize, okay, wait a minute, this one inch is doing fantastic, this half inch is doing fantastic, this quarter inch is doing fantastic, without any issues. Quarter inch. Quarter inch. <laughs> I mean, the quarter inch is actually a big size for me. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it really is because it, to get to the quarter inch is not an easy feat. So that quarter inch, I'm, I'm safe, you know, it, it's growing. And no, I don't need to feed it. I don't feed it anything. We do have a, a, a food that we do make, 
Uh, it's, a, it's a mixed blend, and um, uh, giant clams eat that. There's other things uh, that they don't eat, but that they do. But I don't really sell it. The reason I don't sell it or push it, because I tell everybody the honest truth. I'm not here to push product. I'm here to tell them the truth. The truth is lighting. Lighting. They're photosynthetic. Giant clams are the most, the only photosynthetic clams in the world, meaning that they grow, they can grow big. Right? They don't require food. They're not like the regular oysters or something like that. So, no, it's, it's a myth. Good lighting, good chemistry, and they will grow from a quarter inch all the way to full grown. That's my next question, yeah. is uh, uh, what light is required? And so, uh, sometimes I've heard people say as high as like five, 600 par, and I'm thinking like, oh, there's no place in my tank. <laughs> you know, most of my tank is not gonna be five, 600 par, so this is probably just not a good option for me. Yeah. Is that true? Uh, yeah, well, no, it's not true. I mean, okay, um, for me, we do have uh, indoor facility and also outdoor facility. The outdoor facility, which is great because you have summertime, and summertime in California, it's really sometimes hot. The sun's, you know, intense, things like that. We have PAR reading that's, thank God for all the tech, uh, technology these days. We have PAR meters that's out there 24 days. You know, I'm, I'm looking at exactly the chart, what the average PAR you know, per minute, and I look at the average up for the day, things like that. I can see what colors come out based on the PAR. We also have corals in there, so we can kind of tell what's going on based on PAR. With a uh, indoor, you kind of, it's hard because things don't fluctuate as much. Mm -hmm. You're not in there fluctuating all day, you know, the, the back and forth. And the light, so cloudy days, all of a sudden we get no, no light for a while, right? Uh, so uh, PAR, go back to the PAR thing, is very simple. For me, we can get into more details each species, but just to make it safe and easy for everybody, just keep it at 150 to 350 PAR, you're good. Now, Chrysias will like a little more, I would say 200 to 350. You can go, you can go 450, you can go five. But you gotta be careful because if it's not used to it, you'll start bleaching it. And that's when you see the mantle gets a little pale color. So you can either under light it or over light it. And that's what I'm saying about different species, different depth. Therefore, if you understand that, and then for us playing with that, like a Dorasa, the reason people think it's bulletproof because they kind of are in the fact that they can take 80 par yeah. up to 500 par. And they're fine. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of interesting. You know, I found that with like a lot of LPS tanks, or corals as well. Yeah. It's like you know, like you might call a, you know your torch coral a, a you know low light coral, but or or zoanthid, man. But yeah. like I see these at 350 par all the time. Not a problem. It just kind of takes it, it. You have to acclimate it to that yeah. area, but it will do it. Yeah. Uh, whereas like something like an Acropora needs it. Yeah. Or it's gonna starve to death. Yeah. It, there's know? a big difference. There's a big difference. And that's why, like, from certain maximas in uh, certain regions of the world, uh, don't require too much par. Like, you think it's a maxima, you, you, people crank the par, and then all of a sudden it gets shriveled up. That's because your par was too strong. So, let's repeat that one more time. So, yeah. Duresa, well, oh, what are we looking at? It spit, uh, spit at us. Yeah. Uh, Duresa, <laughs> what are we looking at? Uh, uh, Duresa, par. Uh, par, you can go from 150 just to be safe because par is to me is food, nutrition, right? Just like me, I, I need about 2,000 calories to survive. If you give me par or calories, let's say 500 calories, I'll survive but I won't thrive. Eventually I'll wither away and die. Mm -hmm. So 150 to even up to, let's say safe, 350. You can go more, but just keep it in the safe zone. Well, that's, we're looking for a safe zone here, right? I agree. Because <laughs> like uh, SPS corals, you can, you can put them in, you can train them to be under 600 if you want, you know? Yeah. Uh, but like we have these zones where if you did this, you would be good. That's what we're looking for. Okay. So maxima. Maxima, uh, it depends, well, uh, this is kind of a little tricky. It depends on the species and what location. Because every location in the world is a little, slightly different uh, from what I discovered. Because I, I actually go to the islands and, and measure and do all this stuff, and I see certain locations in the world, they're a little deeper, some are not. But let's say it's safe, as long as you do between, I would say, the lowest would be 150 to uh, 350, and you're fine. You're be, that's a safe zone. Otherwise, you can go a little too far. If it's not ready for it, you could bleach it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then you had the Croatia. The uh, Croceas are, Croceas, yes. Uh, the Croceas, which is, um, oh, oh, they love light. And uh, they actually, the, the colors will pop more if you got a little more light, but you got to slowly increase it. Now, it depends where you get it from. If you get it, like, uh, uh, from us where it's already uh, used to the light, so you can go straight to the, the light, right, the, the, as far as the par. Uh, but with them, they're, they're about 200 to 400, uh, anywhere in between. I, we like to keep around 300, uh, just in the middle, just like when you do alkalinity, you, know, you can do seven to 
10, whatever it's going to be, but we keep it at nine or eight, you're still in the safe zones, what that, that is. Yeah. Okay, so now you have a little bit of guidance and do that. The other thing you have is uh, you can you know, email John and uh, <laughs> just say, hey man, this is where I'm about where I'm at. Yeah. Me. But what I got out of that is a lot of these is really like in you know, a kind of mixed tank zone. 150 to, to yeah. 300 is like, right there, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's like almost any tank. You know, that, that's the thing, and a lot of that is what I want to educate people. It's not like the size that's gonna die. Yes, the problem is when it's smaller, it has less, more, more, more size, more, 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 less meat, right? So eventually you can eat to your reserves very fast, right? Mm. And if your par was too, either too high, you burn the mantle because it's more sensitive, or too low, all of a sudden you not uh, give enough nutrition. Mm. And it's kind of that simple, but of course you got the main thing of anything is start with a very healthy specimen. Very healthy specimen from there and the handoff from there. And we'll talk more about that later on, but yeah, that's very important. Well, let me, let me do this for you. Mm. This is a crocea, and I wanted to take this. Okay. And I want to leave it here for the whole talk. Oh. As a demonstration. All right. I don't know if you can see that, but yeah. By the way, this is yours. Oh, sweet. Yeah. <laughs> but it'll be here for a while. All right, I got to figure out how to get this on, onto the plane in uh, two hours. All right. Figure it out. It's a moment in history right here. Uh, all right. Okay, cool. Next one is yeah. uh, uh, I get concerned about flow. And in, in my mind, it's like these little you know mantles on here. My SPS tank are going to be flapping all over the yeah. place and really unhealthy for it. Yeah. So is that true? Not true. Uh, from where, like, we go, I go jump in the water all the time and see, and I f see the current. And I mean, I was telling uh, Ryan the other day, like, we're, in, we're underneath the water. It, it literally, it's picking me up, and I'm like, hang on onto the rock sometimes. And, you know, my whole body's going that way, and I'm trying to flutter, trying to stay in place, and it's, it, the waves are doing this. Now, it depends where we're at. Certain clams are in more lagoon areas, but it will get an a influx of flow throughout the day. Uh, from my experience, they do really well in good flow. You can go, uh, in our systems, if you go to our show, you see it's a very low flow because I want people to see the clam from above. But ideally, we don't want to keep that situation. Uh, ideally, what we want is, uh, like our system, we have runways, and the runways are blasting with the bees pumps mm -hmm. and also the uh, uh, panta rays. And it's, it's like, you, I'll, I'll see some videos, the, the mantle is like flopping like a, like a balloon that's uh, like, and then, you know, like, and like and if you're sticking out your hand in the car, it's like <laughs> and doing that. But as long as not, directly it doesn't go all the time you know it switches back and forth they love it it's bringing the nutrition the waste in and out so it's like doing the work for it uh so yeah no so that's Myth. interesting because in your in your mind actually i, I want to see the mantle so and if it's, <laughs> if it's doing like flapping in the wind well, no, then, but it stops know? like yeah. our flow does you know just like your your, your your pumps i'm sure you have like it goes for some speed and mm -hmm. then you get the surge whatever it's going to be it's slight slow down otherwise you can't be like pure surge all the time in its one direction it's not really healthy for any coral or anything like that. So it, it, we, we do a little circle gyre, gyre thing. You know, it, it goes 20 minutes this way, it stops, and we, the pump goes back this way. So it, everything's always clean. And then in the system, the pump, the, it's just the match is blown this way, and then it takes a quick break for a little bit. And then we have, we're playing with the, we're always playing with flow, right? And we're trying to get, and especially if like 20 foot runways, it's a lot more work. So you gotta have the big boys. But those big boys, and the clams are not that far away from the big panta ray, or, or the bees, and you can see it when it goes right over the top. It's fine, but the clams grow so fast. You can see that. Have you seen this? Look at this. That is all new shoots, right? Okay. And that just happened re very recently. And it, my point to that is that it grows very fast. If you provide good, healthy water, the clams will attach very fast to the surface, which is the glass, and it doesn't move. It doesn't mm -hmm. move at all. It, once you get that, I'll put it there. Then it senses that that flow. It'll build the bices really. It's like a little suction cup. It sucks and then it bices, it forms, and it hangs on for dear life. So when uh, you're talking about flow, a lot of people like historically have talked about like uh, uh, turbulence has always been this thing they were all after, right? Mm. Okay, but that like, I'm personally finding like I'm shooting for currents. And what you're talking about in these raceways and stuff yeah. is yeah. the water's doing this, yeah. and then we're gonna turn it around and make it go yeah. back the other direction, right? Yeah. Okay, and so strong currents where water's flushing over the surface of something instead of where two currents meet and create all this chaos, you know? Yeah. Some things are, do really well in that, but we're talking about strong flow in these cases, you're suggesting currents. Well, for us as, uh, you have to understand, like for us, we don't have one clam. You know, we have thousands and thousands. Like uh, uh, recently I, I sent, uh, somebody wanted some pictures of clams, what they can maybe purchase or something like that. I sent him, okay, well, let's just quick file. 20,000 clams I sent him one time. So it's like, there's so many of them in there. So my point is we really need a lot. 
and they do they do a lot better than that. And in reality, that's nature also. It's you might you might be there with pausing, but there's a lot of current going, and it's a lot of current. It's either one because most of them come like let's say somewhere in the altos when I'm, I'm diving, and or snorkeling really because it's not really diving. You have a south passage and nor, uh, a north passage. So basically, it's a volcano that's sunk, and you have the the, the crust on top, and that's the only uh, part with the little palm, the, uh, the um, coconut trees, things like that. In the middle, you have all these beautiful clams. But the south passage, which is open water, goes flying through the day one day, a part of the day, and that goes back this way. So it's just current one way current the other way. Mm -hmm. And these climbs thrive in that, in that, those meters, and those are the maxima. So they're all a little different. Based on that, I can kind of calculate what I need to do and experiment with our runways, raising the climbs, breeding them, things like that. Uh, quick answer, you can watch this whole video, but you can also just email them. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so uh, uh, next one is food. And so one of the things, I mean, I have so many misconceptions, I think, yeah. here. So uh, like you need to feed these things phytoplankton mm. or they're gonna die. And I know myself. Sound of setting up a phytoplankton reactor sounds super fun. Love to do it. We'll do it for about six months, and then I'll stop. Uh, I just like I know my life. I know the way that like I have my bandwidth for certain things. Yeah. So phytoplankton necessary? No. As I said, we do have uh, a blend that we do, uh, and it's only f actually for a certain few that actually work for giant clams. A lot of it just, uh, the rest of it kind of feeds the reef, which is fantastic, right? It's good to feed the reef, good to feed all that stuff. For the clams, not necessary. Light's the number one food source. Uh, like I said, if you get those, that par between two to 400 par, uh, depends on the clam, uh, that's like 2,500 calories for the clam. So if you get that, you get a robust fat clam. So do you need more than that? It's like a protein bar. So that's why I don't try to push it or tell people, hey, you need it. I say, no, it's up to you. But for me, it's easy. Fish waste, fish poop, uh, nori, uh, feed mm. the t tangs, that a lot of minerals in that, uh, uh, all the nori. So therefore, it's kind of doing, uh, helping me with trace elements too. So it's like I kind of do double whammy, look at what's easy for nature, easy for me. Uh, growing these things takes a lot of work. Last thing I want to do is make this, make that, and turn this on, turn that on, make more of this, this is running out. No, let's go back to basics. Nature does it best, you know, light, whether it's artificial or sunlight. Let's talk about nature for a second. Uh, you know, uh, I hate to say that you're feeding them poo, but you are. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, delicious. I got bad news for you. That's what's feeding, uh, growing your corn too. Uh, all of our agriculture. You know, like this is just part of nature. Uh, nature recycles itself. You know, uh, and so one of the things uh, uh, about that is when you feed a fish. You know, you feed them a mysis or whatever. Well, it will come back out in a wide variety of particle sizes containing organic nutrients, you know? And that's like why people who feed a lot, especially feeding like on the hour or every other hour or whatever, and matching small amounts of that with, uh, you know, the right filtration, tend to grow animals a lot better. Now that's like a little bit more advanced because you're figuring out the right amount, you're figuring out the right filtration, but they tend to do better with the animals than the people that are like trying to avoid algae and starving and everything, yeah. you know? Very true. Uh, so phytoplankton, no. Uh, all right, do they like, this is another one, I just assume that they all want to be in the sand. Do they want to be in the <laughs> sand or the rock? Okay, this is the funniest thing. I, don't, I, I really honestly don't know where that came from. And everybody, I'm talking about 99% of anybody who comes up to the booth or anybody I talk to or email me. Or that, first thing is, okay, so where to put it in the sand? And I'm, I'm like, where, where, why, like, where did you get, you have to put it in the sand. Well, you're supposed to, right? I don't know if it's just automatic thing or the Reddit or it's just, well, it just looks like it displays better in the sand. Well, in nature, as I say, they sperm and then, you know, eggs happen, things like that. They land where they land and they want, there's a lot of that die. It means majority are, do die because they land in the wrong location. The ones who survive lands in the right location. Do you think the clam knows if it's on the sand or if it's on the rock? Well, I assume that sand, it would just turn over and die. Like, it, it could, and it's, you yeah. Know, it's spilled. Good, good. That's that's exactly. So, but the, if we can, long as it's more par in chemistry, maintain the par, nutrition, chemistry for the rest. You can put anything you want. So as long as you, that's how. I, 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 from there, I just ask the customer, what light are you running? I know the light. Okay, what intensity? I'm like, okay, that intensity, my experience at that level, how many inches? That c should give you around this much par. But use a par meter. That's the number one thing. Without a par meter, I would go lost. I use a par meter every time I move anything, period. Otherwise, I lose thousands of clams at a time. Good news is a uh, par meter was really a resistant item probably five years ago, and mm. now most people have identified that like just plugging your lights and turning them on and hoping for the best mm. produces a predictable result. 
you know, uh, and, or high percentage, low result. Yeah. Uh, but put them on the rock, does that mean that I could take the clam and angle it a little bit towards the front? Because in the sand, presumably, I'm going to have to like have a look down. So mm -hmm. if it's in the rock and yeah. I angle it so I can actually see the mantle? Sure, you definitely can. As long, but you, it's almost like um, you can't guarantee that because this guy has a, a little foot that comes out. It looks like a little tongue, a little white little tongue that comes out. And it's really cute. It comes out and, and, and it moves him around. It's almost like a semi-suction cup that just touches something and kind of moves him where he wants to. So he's going to angle it where it flow and light where he wants. Now think about this. This is, uh, this is a solar panel. The climb is a solar panel. It will open up and it's trying to get light, right? So when it's... Another myth too. When it's when it's feeding, I do this. It doesn't care. It won't close. People are oh, if, if, this means it's healthy. No, I mean it doesn't mean they, they mean that they're saying that it reacts. Mm -hmm. It's not about that. They, they'll pop in when you yeah. see the shadow. But that does. It's not about that. It's when it's feeding mode. If it's like mid afternoon, I'm like I do this all day long. They're like, no, not doing it. I'm not closing it because I'm eating. It's like battery charging. You're t charging Tesla. You want it 100 percent? Well, you got to do the hours. You got to get that. It's the same thing. Tesla, <laughs> car, food, I mean, clam, come on, right? Same thing, right? So, yes, you can put it on the rock. Uh, I can't guarantee that uh, if you do, a, a, like we do some um, cradles or something like that, if you get it attached, yeah, you can move the cradle. But if you do this, eventually it'll attach. It might stay that way, but it, can't, it won't be guaranteed. So the reality is it's yeah. probably going to move towards wherever it's feeding the most. Yeah, and it, it'll do this wherever light or flow, wherever you want. So it's like that. It's, it's stationary, but not stationary. Nerd sometimes. question. Okay. I love them. All right, so <laughs> I'm thinking in my tank, man, I got a specific, I mean, I really want them to be angled towards the glass, you know? Okay. Okay, so, like, I want to see them the best of the light, right? Mm -mm. So what if I got, like, a Kessel, mm -hmm. and I put that little reflector disc on it, so it creates kind of like a focus beam of light that only hits that area angled from the front. Now, is that the best place for it? Now, is it going to want to be aimed towards that light? Well, this, okay, this is actually, it was funny, Josh was just up here, right? And the last thing you guys are talking about, it's like the light in the front, things like that. And I'm yeah. like, and I, my issue is the only time I get clam deaths is because of lack of light. Meaning that this guy's a little smaller, that guy's maybe an inch, a half an inch, even a quarter inch taller. Because he's a little taller, he's gonna open his mantle and it could be covering this guy, which uh, again, shading. shading. So I'm thinking, man, what, how do I do, I need to prevent that. Because otherwise there's a lot of labor sorting each size out because they grow a different rate. Could be the same breed. One grows this small, the other guy's this big already and at the same time. So, and usually a lot of that is because shading. He didn't grow fast, and the next guy's shading, and all of a sudden it's the same age, mm -hmm. different size based on shading. So, Purely the amount of photons that hit it, the calories essentially. Production. Calories. You know, if you ate more, you're gonna be a little bigger, you ate less, you're gonna be a little smaller. There's no way around that. So, right? just like to connect the dots here, the amount of photons that hit it is the amount of carbohydrates it will produce. So the photon calorie conversation is in link. It is, he's literally, he's not a conceptual thing, it's yeah. a literal thing. Yeah. The amount of photons in there is the amount of carbohydrate calor uh, calories and protein it's gonna produce, yes. or amino acids. Yes, there you go. And, and that's a big difference. And, I, and, and to your, your question about putting the light in front, I'm thinking, well, how do I do it while I put it in front and make sure, because we're constantly putting our arm inside, I don't want water to hit the light. Because we're, I'm thinking of even putting like putting it next to the glass and those beautiful uh, aqua illumination blades because I love them so much because they're so wide spectrum, uh, and, and uh, as far as uh, coverage that is, um, yeah, uh, yes, they will go towards light. So they don't they don't know where sun is. I mean, relatively really or light. So yeah, they'll move towards trick light. Them. You yeah. trick them. Yeah. Okay, uh, next one here is uh, it's a is are they a a filter? Will they clean the water? Can I get rid of my skimmer instead of have just a bunch of your clamps? <laughs> I get a lot of that email too. Everybody's, oh, I can't wait to do it by uh, some. I think I think you remember, you remember one time about that. Somebody wrote me a couple times about using instead of a you know filter or whatever you're using your sump, use clamps. I'm like, they're pumping water in and out all day long. <laughs> you know, that you had like a little field of them. They probably process most of the water in a day. Well, you would think. I mean, they do in a certain extent. So what I did, I, I did some testing. So I, with so many clams in a, such a small uh, space, you know, whether I can use whatever space I'm using, there's always high density of clams. So I'll, I'll measure our phosphate at zero, right? I'm like, okay, it got down to zero. Okay, let's add some phosphate. Time at 12 o'clock, phosphate added X amount. To test the water, how much is the concentration parts per billion, things like that, with the phosphate. I'll do it an hour later. I'm like, okay, what's the, what's the concentration of phosphate? Is it dropping? Yes, it is. Okay, let's two hours. What's, uh, and it will go down and go to zero pretty fast, but that's, Lots of clams. Mm -hmm. So it, one clam, two clam, three clam, it's a concentration of clams you might have. Most of we don't have that much. But going, they, so I did it with nitrates and phosphates, it definitely lowered it. Now, the only the issue is as far as you want it for using uh, to all the gunk and everything else in your system, not really. 
can I use a clam for uh, uh, um, uh, without a skimmer? Definitely. I run systems sometimes without skimmers, no time. Uh, for six months, I'm like, oh, maybe time to put a skimmer, and then you might get some skimmate, right? Most of the skimmate really came from the uh, zoanthalia. Oh, that's another thing. Um, clams are the number one producers of zoanthalia. Mm. So when a, when a reef bleaches, cor the coral bleaches, these guys come to the rescue. Because if you look really at my systems, it. all that brown stuff in my system on, on top, mm -hmm. on all my shows, people are like, what is that brown stuff? That's zoanthalia. They produce it and they spit it out like this is no normal. It's like non-stop. Yeah. yeah. So I would have thought actually the opposite is I would have thought that they were pumping water in, yeah. feeding on the organics. Mm. But what you're actually saying is basically not necessarily as a filter, but if you put nitrate and phosphate, which is like inorganic nutrients, yeah. it's sucking it up into tissue built yeah. uh, uh, growth. So just through organic uptake. Yeah, it's just like the same thing as uh, corals. You're going to need a little mm. percentage of phosphorus and things like that. For uh, you know, they need that. Of course, you're going to need alkaline, calcium, all the trace elements. They'll consume that. I'll see what they consume. It's kind of almost like a plant. They'll consume a lot of like um, iron and things like that. But for the most part, yeah, it, you don't need anything else, uh, uh, and they won't filter you know, gunk, really bad stuff out. They, they will filter what they need to consume to grow. Uh, and to be frank, man, uh, this conversation really only applies if you decide to become a collector. Uh, <laughs> you're you're going to have a whole bunch of these, like a field of them, not because you put two of them in your Yeah, yeah, two doesn't count. Yeah, you're like, people ask me, oh, my calcium is going to go crazy. I'm like, not a one or two. <laughs> eventually, it depends on what you're dosing, but eventually you have to dose. Like any coral gets bigger. Uh, parasites. Corals have parasites. Fish have parasites. What about these things? Pyramid snails. Pyramid snails, a thing that'll attack it? Yeah, uh, snails, they're just pyramids. They'll, they'll attack any mollusks, and they, they, but they could come on your snails. So they'll jump on the snails and eat on the snails. So sometimes you think it's on the clam, it really came from your snails sometimes, like turbo snails, whatever, you know, wh whatever snails it, it came on, whatever, where it came from. Mm -hmm. uh, but arasis, I mean, it's like almost like, if you go back to nature, nature does its best. The reason why everything's under control, and then even if you had some pyramid snails, believe it or not, you had arasis, or you don't, if your light's good enough, the clam kind of, it's not a big deal for them. Outgrows the thing that's eating on it? Yeah. And then my always thing is we always put uh, uh, rasses and make sure you're always clean. Because those guys, they, they look for little baby snails and they're like <laughs> plucking that. Hunted. Hunting, hunting, hunting all day long. So it's like you just use the natural way, right? And you don't want to harm the clam. And for us, we are very you know careful about that and things like that. Because in thousands, if I have thousands, I, I get an infestation. Yeah, then I'll lose a lot. And I can't, we can't do that. So we have to be very careful with that, then, but we also have protocols for that too. Uh, and uh, yeah, A, you don't get them in the first place. B, if you do, do not worry, you're fine. You maintain good water quality, good lighting, put some good rasses inside, they'll do their job, and then uh, you're good. I think about it like turns of like the Monty eating Neuterbronx. Hmm. You know, like you get those things, uh, and then you could like decide to, to shut your tank down if you wanted to, or you could go buy a six line ras and call it a day. Uh, it's just like, you know, it's part of the new live world you live in, you know, uh, you're going to blow them off. Uh, I wouldn't suggest a six line. I used that in my case. It totally wiped out all of the nudies in, in the tank became, shouldn't say totally wiped out. There was no visual signs of these things anymore. As soon as the fish is gone, they'll come back. Yeah. Uh, but instead, man, I would suggest others. And before I say them, what rasses do you suggest? For this, uh, you could use. I, I use cheap rasses, and I like leopard rasses because so they're beautiful and they're fairly cheap. Uh, you know, for me, we're we're not looking to put some crazy expensive rasses. So anything that's cheap, uh, leopard rasses, uh, uh, Mullenlaris rasses. Mullenlaris. We use a lot of those. We the, and then uh, get some um, small to medium size, nothing too big, because the big boys, what they do is they're so big, and they they'll like move things around. Uh. You know, so keep them sm relatively small. Yeah. So would something in this? I use. Yellow and green chorus grass. Yeah. Those will work? Yeah. It, pick your color you like. You know, they, they all kind of work in that, and they're those guys. And I like them because they're not like, very expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're pretty pretty friendly for the most part, right? So. Only well, yeah. the problem is they jump. Uh, but they're yeah. inexpensive and colorful. Uh, <laughs> OK, so next, what are the common sizes you find these things, and what is the speed at which they grow? Common sizes as far as like age-wise or? Um, yeah, when you're, gonna, when you're gonna buy these things, like what size should you expect them to be normally? Like what ah, kind of speed will they grow at? Okay, okay. You know, like if I've got a two inch one, like when's it gonna become four inch, that kind of? Yeah, well it depends on the species. Gigas and Dorasa will grow tremendously fast. Uh, you can get one that's, uh, let's say you can get start with a, uh, a three inch uh, Gigas or Dorasa in six months you're probably, so you can get some like start like this and six months it could be like that, you know? So if you wanted to, it, it can grow like, 
half an inch to an inch. It depends on your water parameters, if you have enough alkalinity and things like that, if it's all steady. And if you have a steady uh, amount of alkalinity and nothing's fluctuating, you will grow a lot faster, just like corals, right? It's that steady dosing will give you that magic growth fast, right? You get more of this beautiful white lines right here. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so that would be like, um, I would say a quarter inch to a half an inch, even to an inch uh, on Drossus and Gygus. They do grow fast, but they're, it's funny, it's like uh, adults and humans, like they get to a certain stage, they stop a little bit, and all of a sudden, they, all of a sudden you don't see anything, and then they grow really large. Yeah. So there's no like pre predictability on that, in, in no essence. I just know one will grow a lot faster than the other one. Crisillas and Maximas are a lot slower, quarter inch to maybe half an inch, maybe even less. Well, a lot of animals will do that. They'll like spend all of their energy finding like, you know, trying to find like a certain level of growth where they, you know, things are more stable for it. And then they need to like kind of recover that energy yeah. for general metabolic function and then they will burst again. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, uh, interesting. Okay. Uh, Okay, you said here that, and I talked to you last night, that they actually look different all oh, the time. What does oh, that mean? Oh, okay. This is, this is very interesting. Uh, okay, this is what you get when you start, when you're breeding and raising from like, you know, from nothing, when you really can't really tell what color it is, right? Initially, I'm like, I don't know what that is. I mean, it's something, right? It's a clam, giant clam, I know for sure. Uh, I know the species, but I have no idea like what it's gonna look like. I don't know if it's gonna be gold, yellow, green, yellow stripes, or whatever it's gonna be. So it's the funny thing is like over time, so I compare it like, uh, I, I was, I was uh, I forget who was asking. I think it was Jennifer from uh, Marco Rocks asked me, and I said, Jen, look at that one-year-old right there. The lady's holding the one-year-old. What do you think that one-year-old's gonna look like? And she's like, I don't. Do you, th do you know what that one-year-old's gonna look like when it becomes an adult? So it's a comparison to almost a humans. Like you don't know until you, you see as it gets to the teenage years, to the adulthood, and things like that. Um, what I, once I get to like the teenage years, to like the one-inch mark, I can know pretty much what it's gonna look like. Uh, of course, the colors eventually get even more bold. If it, there's blue, that blue would be more bold. If there's orange, it'd be more bold orange. Once you get to the two inch mark, now this is gonna be pretty much almost the same for all the clams, but you know, a little, little off by a few months here and there. But uh, that two inch to three inch, you'll see more. But even then, four inch fire which might give you more colors. Like for example, which is one of the most interesting I saw, is like we have some gold ones. I'm like, okay, plain gold, nice. All of a sudden, because we bred it with teardrops, right? See nothing. Wait. One day, you come out there, and there's a couple of teardrops coming in. You're like, oh, we got teardrops on this one. It was just plain brown. It got to a certain age, all of a sudden, the teardrops come in. So it's kind of us, like, you know, like some of us blossom a different time. Mm. And that's what happened with them, too. Yeah. So I'm curious, like, uh, if any of you will have the same experience as me. In the first tank, I want this stuff to grow as fast as humanly possible. <laughs> like, I just like, I want to get to the end game as fast as possible. Now, when you told me that some of these things grow a little bit slower, yeah. like, ah, perfect for me because I don't actually like pruning, turns out. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, the, if I can watch the journey in the tank, mm -hmm. uh, this is actually a cooler uh, item for me in some ways, is I can watch something slowly develop over time it doesn't require the same kind of like bonsai garden pruning that, that many corals require. So kind of cool thing. Uh, all right, how many of these things can you put in a tank? Now, I guess I, 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 I don't know. I, I mean, <laughs> how many can you put in there? Well, I get that question a lot. It's like the, the, one of the first questions I always get, uh, because there was, the reason why, because it's a very fair question. They'll, after that, say I have a 20 gallon or a five gallon, you know, I have a, a 50 gallon. They'll say I have a 100 gallon, so I think I only can have one. I'm looking, I'm like, okay, well, look at our display here. Usually at the shows we have like a five gallon and a four gallon, which is very small, but I can get 500 clams in there, right? So I said, if I can maintain 500 clams, and honestly, and definitely, if I put the doser in and maintain the heater, pump, skimmer, and the light, and a nice doser, to, and also to make sure trace elements are kept up, I can keep it there. The only thing, what's gonna stop me from, is the clams growing, then I gotta remove some because they're just pushing to the sides. All right, so, I've heard there's a certain amount or something like that nonsense that didn't make sense to me. It's like corals. <laughs> take care of it, you know, I, yeah. I don't understand why there would yeah. be a concentration problem. So in my mind, I'm deciding right now, like, do I want to put, you know, a ton of these throughout the aquascape or do something else that I've been talking about for a while, which is, you know, who here has like never wanted to set up a separate tank for something specific, but doesn't want to set up a separate tank? <laughs> you know, like that's you know, all of us, right? Uh, like all I can think of is like, why don't I just set up another tank like uh, that is just plumbed into the existing one? 
You know, so set up a small little display that you know displays this thing I like right next to the other tank mm. and plumb it into the sump of the existing one, which means no more pumps or yeah. like I guess one return pump or whatever. Like, but no, like I don't have like duplicate you know, work to do and all of this yeah. stuff. And, yeah. and the water is like the small little tank has the benefit of the large amount of water in the big tank. Yeah. You know? yeah. and like, it's not going to be <clears throat> zero more work, but much less work than two totally separate systems. Much simpler. One yeah. skimmer, one everything, kind of it becomes a lot easier. Uh, like, yeah. you know, if you use one, one controller or yeah. whatever, right? Yeah. One set of heaters. Yeah, you know, that that's, kind of that's how we do it. It's much better unless we really have to keep it separate. So do I pepper these cool clamps throughout my aquascape or do I create this like cool like look down tank like right next to the tank? I know, I, I know my vote. What? Both. Because <laughs> <laughs> okay. that's, for me, it's a two different experience. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. It's like um, you want to go to the beach and do you want to, uh, you know, walk in the sand and or do you want to go diving and go snorkeling? I kind of do want to do both. Mm -hmm. why, why make me do one? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the reason why is you, you can put that display and it's it, the visual if you, uh, the visual of corals next to a clam and the contrasting colors of that clam being blue and if it's orange coral in the background, it's a contrast. It makes it like, I don't know what it is about our, our industry and all the corals and and the clams and all these beautiful creatures and fish, it's that when you look at them, somehow you just get this, I don't know, a, a, a overwhelming uh, happiness feeling. Mm -hmm. And for me to see that, and then now a look down tank, if you, you guys go see my system looking down at the displays, usually at the show, people sit there for hours. I mean, my booth is always very busy just for the fact that people can't decide and they just want to look at the that. If you haven't seen a look down of clams, yeah. man, you have no idea. Go Google it, uh, YouTube it, whatever it is. Yeah. Like, it is a, something totally different. It's different. I've always, like, cause I see these things at the shows all the time. You know, they often have like those zero edge tanks. And yeah, stuff oh, like, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, and you see it and it's like, why is this not more popular? <laughs> you know, like this is so much cooler than so many other things. Yeah. Well, what is holding people back? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think it's just this knowledge and like all of these things that They're like- scared, they have bad experience or someone else bad experience. And I, I understand that the reason why I got into this is because I had this bad experience. I loved them so much, but I didn't want to quit on them and not figure it out. And I, I, at one point I slowed down my business just so I can travel more and go to these places, test every day five, at 5 a.m., 7 a.m., 10 a.m., 12 p.m., peak hours and me measuring pH, all this stuff. And I've been talking about pH for the last three years because I want, what I figured out was that why don't I just mimic the, the ocean? And right next mm -hmm. to the, the clam, I did the ICB test. I'm like, well, that's very similar. That's right. But what's the, what's the factor that's different? And, I, and when you do these things, you can really figure out, aha. Uh -huh. But it mm -hmm. takes a lot. And that's, that's the reason I got into it. It's just because I was sick and tired of clams dying and not mm -hmm. figuring it out. I'm like, There's a, how can I go live in the wild and die in our system. Like, what are we doing wrong? Mm -hmm. And that was the biggest thing that drove me crazy. So what do you think was the biggest factor in the end? Uh, believe it or not, now, before, before, I mean, before I was told everybody was you know, alkalinity and pH, keep it over eight, da da da. And that was very true. I wasn't wrong about that. I mean, now everybody's saying it. I'm like, aha, uh -huh, see? But now it's light. It's really the light. Well, a, first, get a, make sure they're healthy. Um, less touching to, you know, because that's nothing when we get to the acclimation, things like that. If you do it wrong, if one person hands it to you, but they did it wrong, then all, all of a sudden this guy's stressed. Now I put this here, you're like, this guy's stressing the clam. I'm not, because I know this is not gonna hurt it, mm -hmm. right? So if the person doesn't know what they're doing and they stress the clam, um, and you get the product, this beautiful clam, if it's stress, you already have a stress clam that's really halfway, not, you know, not gonna make it, immune systems compromised, things like that. Part of the reason you might not heard it is because this thing naturally will, you know, be out of the water during tides in many places, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, for example, when I was in the Red Sea, um, it started raining like crazy. And then all the clams I was watching, I was just earlier, you know, that day, I was like, you know, swimming in it. And it was like maybe about waist high and I was just going down and filming all these beautiful maximas. Can you believe that? Um, it started raining and then the tide went down and I can see from my room, I had one of the front rooms, that rain was on the clam. I mean, talking about pouring rain, we had floods like uh, by the rooms, like some of the rooms were flooded. It was so it was pouring. Major chemistry, salinity problems. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. Like uh. next day, boop, wide open. So this happens. Resilient. And Resilient. Yeah. And there, the Red Sea is uh, considered uh, where, where the original clams and corals came from. Though. And then uh, I talked to uh, giant clam scientists. There's 
Did you know there's giant clam scientists? Yeah, no, I, <laughs> well, I guess I would have presumed, but no, but, I hadn't thought about it. Right. <laughs> so they'll 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 they'll, they'll uh, drill them to the core, and and every whatever it is as far as measurement, they can tell how many days old it is. And it goes back to like three, as I said, it was like 200 or 500,000 uh, years ago. And I did an interview with him and get all this information. Um, uh, Dan from the, the, he ran the biosphere. But it, anyways, it, it's so resilient. It goes back so long that, you know, they all originate from there and also the corals, it looks, it sounds like based on just you know, aging of, the, of, of uh, all that. Um, but yeah, so it's like, that's how resilient they are. They've been out forever. So I'm gonna go out on a limb here mm. that 20 years ago, the problem was probably under lighting them. And like, it feels like with most things yeah. recently, the problem was actually over lighting them. It's either still both, depends on the person, depends what they're running. And I look at their system, if it, you know, newer hobbyists usually are a little under lighting it because it's more affordable by li lower lighting, cheaper light that is. Uh, which is okay, nothing wrong with that. You just gotta bring the clam a little higher. You know, I'm like, okay, what do you have? I'm like, okay, okay, what's the part? Okay, then bring it at this, this level. But yeah, you're correct. The, yeah. You can definitely burn it very fast. And then some Corsias, believe it or not, and that's another myth. Everybody says Drosters are the easiest. My experience, Corsias are the easiest. Really? Just because of the light, just to get the light right and it's get the easiest? It can tolerate the high. It can, it's just, just more resilient. And it, you can have lots of fluctuating chemistry and things like that, and the Drosa will, not look great, Corsia is still fine. So it, it's, it's, it's a lot of myths out there. So like when people say, oh, John, yeah, Durasso's, give me the easy one. I'm like, well, actually this one, they're like, right. and they have to convince them. I got another one then. Yeah. Water quality and like uh, excess nutrients mm. and pollution and all that yeah. kind of stuff in the tank. Yeah. How big a deal is that for this? It's a big deal. Um, uh, they do like good water quality. So I would say as far as water quality, I run it like a, you know, like a mixed reef uh, to even SPS. I, we run our system more like SPS because we have a lot of SPS in there and we find it, it to grow better that way because you know, too much phosphate nitrate is not good for anything really, honestly. Uh, you know, in the high, high amount, it, you've, soft corals, things like that, they can tolerate more. Are you willing to brave the magic numbers? that yeah, everybody wants to know, uh. we all acknowledge <laughs> it doesn't, it's not real, you know? Yeah. But we all want to know at the same time, like, give me a window, uh, give me something. Well, you know, like 50 uh, parts for uh, for um, nitrates, but I mean, it's that's kind of high. That's I, high. I, that's too high, like, I mean, you, you, it can, it'd be fine. But then you're at the brink of like, why? The brink mm -hmm. of let's, like, are you gonna wait for a crash or some other stuff besides the clam? Right, the clam can be fine, and what I find out with a lot of customers, because not everybody has the best water, they will be fine. A, you got to start, and the other thing has to work out is they start with a healthy one. Again, that's like the most important thing. Acclimation, how you did it in the first place, right, is so important. I can give you a very healthy clam. You, you do a horrible job acclimating, you, you can make it a little sick. Uh, and then good lighting. And then they can recover from all bad stuff, is what I'm saying. And majority of the time, what I learned for moving to like trace elements. I'd rather have it a little too low than too high. Too high of anything is bad. Toxic. Period. Toxic. Too little, little, eh, no big deal. It doesn't grow as fast here and there. It's still thriving. It's still colorful. So that's one of the things for me is like when you think of nitrate and phosphate as pollution, these are like actually just like indicators. Yeah. You know, like this is the thing that you can measure. And then there's all this other stuff that yeah. you know, is coming in when that food that isn't like consumed in the exact ratio in which you added it. And you think that, oh, my ICP test would measure it. It's not true. It doesn't measure all of these things. No. And it doesn't measure all of them accurately every time either. That's a thing. You know? I agree. And so uh, like, you know, the pollution bit for me is, is touchy. Like I don't, I don't really know where the magic number is, but one of the things like you say 50, well, Okay, then we get to this conversation of pollution just doesn't matter or something, you get past that. But once you get there, people don't actually go to 50, they go to unmeasurable. The amount of tanks where I've seen where you've adopted like the dirty tank kind of idea, yeah, yeah. where you could do a 50% water change and this test kit still doesn't measure it. I mean, you're like in the hundreds, you know, like you're so far beyond. It's blinking, you know? it doesn't even function as exactly. And, and then like, th if you think about it that way, like how much other stuff is in that water at that point? Yeah. You know, yeah. not just those things. And yeah. the answer is probably a lot. Yeah. All right, burping, what, I have no idea, what is this? Okay, okay, the burping is the thing that, that's been it out for, this is another myth. I, I wanna just, this is great, right? The great platform to, to, to you know, tell some of these myths that's not true anymore. Uh, burping, so people think, okay, you put the clam, this is salt water, I hope so, let's see. <laughs> well, it is. Uh, so you, you put the clam inside, and what you do is you wanna make sure there's no air bubble. 
They're concerned the air bubble will somehow uh, make the clam feel, you know, whatever it is. But that's not true. As I said, in the Red Sea, the clam didn't burp itself. You know, like I didn't have to go there and, and, and burp the clam. The Egyptians weren't burping the clams back in the days. Uh, <laughs> Somehow I feel like they wouldn't exist if that was necessary. You know what I mean? So what kind of nonsense is this? You know, the clams are fine. I, I can put this clam in and a dunk, whatever it's going to be. It will burp itself. If there's an air bubble, they'll squeeze it out and then call it the day. Right? It's like us passing a little gas, a little air. We're gone. We're fine. No one's going to ask us to hit our belly or something like that. Nonsense thing. Nonsense, yeah. What about toe and foot? Ah, okay, that's another thing. I get a lot. So these are the things I get a lot of, and and, and, and I guarantee 95% of you guys believe in this stuff and hear this stuff all the time. There's a little foot in the bottom here yes. that attaches to things. Yeah, so if I don't even see the camera and pick it up, but this right here, uh, right here, it, it's a flat part, which is nice, but what happens is this flat part, it's like this I could call like the lips, and also you see a little tongue or foot coming out. You can call it a foot, you can call it whatever. I mean, wh whoever named it, whatever, that's great. When they call it a foot, we'll call it a foot. But it, it comes out like a little tongue that, that comes out, out of this mouth area and it moves it around. Now that itself, and it, the clam will suck into the rock area, wherever it's happy with. And then from there, it will build this gelatin. It literally looks like a, a, like a little uh, a ge like gelatinous material. And over time, in that gelatinous material, you see fibers of byssus. It looks like, I could describe it as spider web, meaning that you can cut it off, no problem, no pain. So if they ever see this spider web hanging around, they th they'll say, hey, that's the foot. You tore the foot off. It's a bad clam or whatever it is. And I'm like, no. It's like us building a spider web to hang onto a wall, whatever it is, and that's all it is. It's hanging on to a rock, and it wants to be safe from the being thrown away because they know, hey, this spot, I'm getting good light. I'm living. I'm thriving. I'm building this bisis sp spider web, whatever you call it, and that's it. And for me, if I need to remove it, I either take a razor and I cut it off and call it a day. Pretty simple, and then if, if the and then it'll detach that spider web from the mouth area or this bottom part, and it'll fall away. Away, and what people think is a foot, it's just a spider web, and then it'll build another gelatinous thing, and then the threads will come out of that. I have videos where, where the little tiny threads are slowly forming, and all of a sudden it becomes full threads. All right, uh, there'll be a debate on this one, but. Uh, I'm willing to insta tank an LPS tank because I've done it so many times it doesn't matter and I, I know how to do it and I have no problem doing this. I have found that insta taking SPS tanks, not the best idea and if I'm going to do that, man, I better put an enormous amount of work into the biome of this thing, getting it stable and really pay close attention to it. Can you insta tank clam tanks? Yeah. I thought this would be a fun topic right here. Uh, instant tanking, and that is a good question. Instant tanking, meaning that what he's referring to is that uh, starting a tank day one, put clams in it. I mean, is that kind of crazy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've done it many times. Really? Over and over and over. Yeah, new mm -hmm. systems, like if I need space, I'm like, oh, well, need space, don't have time. Well, it's kind of instant. I just make sure I, I leverage everything. I just use like maybe a couple rub rubbles of like established tank. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have to be big, whatever it is. Whatever, put it back in the, you know, uh, whatever it's your filtrating or anywhere you have that water runs through. But think about this. This right here is three and a half, four years old. Mm -hmm. The shell. What is a shell? Rock. Live rock. Mm. I'm insert tanking with my live rocks too. So I put a bunch of clams in there. All from there, it's just chemistry and lighting. Mm. So, and yeah. I don't put fish in there. That, that's the thing. As long as you don't put fish to put any other waste to make it kind of, it, it basically, nothing happens. It, it, it thrives. It's fine. Chemistry. So this is a good point. Like I, I don't see a lot of like first time beginners going to an instant tank in a clam no. or a clam tank. Yeah. Okay. But like what if you were to just like keep some rock in your sump just in case I want to do something fun in the future. Mm -hmm. You know? Okay. Well now, man, I have the ability to like insta tank and get it cycled. Cause I can tell you right now using that TBS rock, mm -hmm. uh, that I get insta tank that with that with SPS. I'm going to do it. You know, wow. you'll see the result of it, wow. right? Wow. Uh, but like that is as live as it gets. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Okay. But also if I took that same rock that's just kind of like living in my tank and in my sump, and then I built another tank out of it, like you were just talking about, you're taking some rubble out of it, yeah. taking these things out, which have some of their own like natural biome, yeah. and then put it in there, that'd be an interesting uh, outcome. But this is like now again, not your first rodeo. It's because you have an existing tank almost, you yeah. have a skill set here. And then for, because I have a lot of confidence, I know what I'm doing, it's a different story. And it, it will, it's, uh, the question is, yes, it's possible. Do I recommend to everybody? No, because the fact that it's, uh, it's not your, it's usually their first rodeo doing this. And then, you know, they're worried and things like that. But if let's say Ryan was gonna do it and John helped me guide them, like Ryan, let me help you with that and, and tell what to do. Because I do it all the time without any issues. I can set up a system and then, and, 
and it'll be fine forever and six months later it's still fine like nothing dies but I know not to put other fish things like that you know I'm not I'm not adding waste in as a, like they're not producing much waste hmm. right so I'm not adding waste in I'm just adding chemicals that they need trace things like that lighting what they need I just give them what they need I don't put things that they don't want or that's gonna mess up the water but that's now then eventually I'll put a couple small tangs a couple small wrasses call it the day I'm fine instant tank for me not saying you should it's just a question, and I know I, we can do it, but you have to know what you're doing. You, don't do it if you're a beginner. If you're established, reefer, things like that, different story, reach out to me, I'll help you out, but I'm just saying, it's possible. All right, does anybody here feel like they have what's the knowledge required to take care of a cam, clam at this point? Yes. Okay, I see 100% nods. <laughs> uh, I feel like I have the knowledge to attempt this. <laughs> I am going to figure out, I didn't plan on it until I saw you uh, at the, here at the show at Reef Blueza. Uh, I am going to incorporate clams into one of these systems or more than one of them somehow. You will see the outcome of the lessons that uh, we have learned here today. Yeah. Uh, I cannot wait. Oh, I can't uh, wait too. Uh, an alarm just told me that I need to go home from Dallas back to Minneapolis. Okay. Uh, so uh, yeah. we will see you at the next show. Yes. Right on. And the check, don't forget your clam. All right. Thank you Thanks, all. Thanks, guys. All right. That was awesome.